the PSAT is this month and I haven't studied for a second. Does that sound like you? Stick around and let's do a last minute study on the PSAT. Okay, we are going to start with a main idea question. So just like most reading questions, the main idea questions always have the same similar setup, which is that they ask you about the main idea. And although this isn't the case in every piece of English, in SAT world, the main idea lives at the beginning and at the end of the paragraph. So we are going to focus on these last two sentences. So let's read this and our ears will perk on those first and last sentence. In many of his sculptures, artist Richard Hunt uses broad forms rather than extreme accuracy to hint at specific people or ideas. In his first major work, Arachne, Hunt constructed the mythical character Arachne, a weaver who has changed into a spider, by wielding bits of steel together into something that, though vaguely human, is strange and machine-like. And his large bronze sculpture, The Light of Truth, commemorates activist and journalist Ida B. Wells using mainly flowing curved pieces of metal that create stylized frame. Okay, so first sentence. In many of his sculptures, Artist Hunt uses broad forms rather than extreme accuracy to hint at people or specific ideas. So I'm going to write a title based off of that. And the second sentence, does it give me much else? It gives me an example. So we have two kind of examples here. Commemorates. So something about maybe he's commemorating people, mainly flowing curved pieces. So mainly flowing curved pieces of metal that creates a stylized frame. That goes into that broad form. So I'm going to say Hunt creates unrealistic human forms for his subjects. Cool. Okay. So this is literally what you'd want to write in your annotations on Blue Book. There's a little annotation button or you can use your scratch paper. And now that we have that, we can go into elimination. He often depicts the subjects of his sculpture using an unrealistic style. Oh, boom. Didn't even do that on purpose. Promise. Unrealistic. That's good. Okay, let's see what the other ones are. He uses different kinds of materials depending on what sculpture he plans to create. That might be true, but it's not mentioned in the first or last sentence, so we can't say that's the main idea of the text. He tends to base his art on important historical figures rather than on fictional characters. Okay, mythical character Arachne, not in the first or last sentence, but we did read the paragraph so we know what's up. Um, so definitely not historical figures. He has altered his approach to sculpture over time and his works have become increasingly abstract. We know it's abstract, but we don't know if it's over time. So we can't prove that one. And of course, A super matched our annotation. So that is a really good sign that I'm on the right track and it's A, main idea. First and last sentence. Next up, we have kind of a tricky systems of equation problems that might confuse you because there's a lot of X's and Y's going on here. So main rule of thumb, if you've watched any of my previous videos, is that anytime you run into a systems of equation problem, you're going to want to put it into Desmos because it's going to do the work for you. So don't eliminate, don't substitute, it's not worth it. So I'm going to put this into Desmos. So you'll notice that the first one is a parabola and the second one is a line. So a lot of the times with these systems problems, you're going to have two lines. So this one's a little different because there's two points of intersection. So we have negative 2, 1, and negative 1, 0. So this is our x1, y1, and our x2, y2. It doesn't matter which one's which, as long as they're consistent. And the question is asking us, what is the value of y1 plus y2? y1 plus y2 is 1. So super easy if you can graph it and not have to deal with elimination or substitution. Be careful when you're looking at these systems graphs that you're not looking at your y-intercepts, or in this case, doesn't matter because the x-intercept is there, but sometimes the x-intercept isn't a part of the intersection points, and you're also going to want to ignore that. So just some food for thought there with systems, but always, always, always graph these. Next up, we've got sneaky percentages problems. So percents to me are just like fancy ways of making ratios, and especially with these charts, we want to continue to use the rule of part over whole to find these percents. 
So let's read through this and see what I mean by part over whole. Usually this top paragraph doesn't give us too much past what the chart is already going to give us, but let's read it anyways. According to the 2010 census, the adult population aged 18 years or greater in the United States in 2010 was that big old number. In 2010, a survey was conducted among a randomly chosen sample of adults aged 18 years or greater in the United States about their preferences to live in a warm climate or a cool climate. The table below displays a summary of the survey results. So looking at this, I see warm, cool, no preference, and then the amount of people. So it looks like they interviewed 1,600 people, and this is how it broke down. So let's look at what our question is asking us. Which of the following is closest to the difference between the percent of adults aged 18 to 50 years who responded warm and the percentage of adults aged 51 years or greater who responded warm? So 18 to 50 is this bracket here, and 51 or greater is these two here. So they're being tricky because they're asking us to add up more than just one row. So warm is these guys and these guys. So again, part over whole. So our part of our 18 to 50 group is 295 plus 246. And our whole is how many people in total they interviewed from that group. So it's not going to be this total. It's actually going to be the total of people they interviewed in that age bracket. So 508 plus 410. And I'm not adding these up yet because you can throw this whole thing into Desmos and get a fraction. And then we're going to set up the same thing for greater than 50. So 238 plus 137, that's our part over our whole, 403 plus 279. So now we're going to get our fractions. So I've gone ahead and put these into Desmos and I've gotten these two big old fractions here. So just a couple things to note about Desmos. When you are building fractions that have addition in them or subtraction, you're going to want to put at least parentheses on the numerator so that it stays as one fraction and doesn't split into two fractions or more. Um, so now that I've gotten both of these, I can convert these to percentages. So I have 0.589 and 0.549. So 0.589 and 0.549. And all we do to convert decimals to percentages is to move that decimal place over. So 58.9% and 54.9% means we have a difference of, if we subtract these, 4%. Yeah? So decimals to percentages, you just move the decimal place over 2. If we're going from percentages to decimals, it'd be the other way around. We'd go two to the left. And that is how we use this same ratio rule of part over whole to find percentages. These next two problems are coming straight from this packet that is linked in our description that gives you almost 12 pages worth of problems to practice. So the English question that I pulled from this packet is one of my favorite English questions. I don't know why, I just really like these. It's what we call misplaced modifiers. And all that means is that these questions are easy to find because they always have an introductory phrase and then four answer choices that are basically the same sentence, just worded differently. So all you're doing is you're matching this introductory phrase to whatever it's modifying. So truly, all we have to do with these is be able to identify the subject of each one of these answer choices, because the subject of the sentence is what an introductory phrase is always modifying. It is giving some extra information before we jump into the sentence. So I'm going to actually go through the answer choices and just underline for myself what these subjects are. The reduction of urban heat islands. So of is telling me that everything after it is modifying whatever the subject is. So reduction is our subject here. W reduction of what? Urban heat islands. These gardens have, awesome, so gardens. The gardens facilitation, okay, so gardens is possessive there. So it's got to be 
facilitation, because possessive words are also modifying a noun. Urban heat islands, awesome. So urban heat islands, that's easy. So we have reduction, gardens, facilitation, and urban heat islands. So let's read the introductory phrase. By creating green spaces in densely populated areas. Okay, so we know it's definitely not gardens or urban heat islands because neither of those things can create green spaces. So reduction or facilitation. So they're creating, so it's probably facilitation. Let's just read it all the way through and make sure it sounds good. By creating green spaces in densely populated area, the garden's facilitation of the reduction of heat islands and improvement of air quality has been noticed. Okay, that makes sense. Why reduction doesn't work is that really this facilitation of creating the green spaces is what's led to the reduction of heat islands. So we need to have facilitation be with this description here. So the steps for this one are find your subjects, read your introductory phrase, eliminate, and then find the best choice that is matching what this introductory phrase is talking about. Last one for today is also from our handy dandy packet link down below. And it's one that gives my students a lot of fear sometimes, but they're actually not too bad. So they always give a bunch of variables like this. And the setup is which equation correctly expresses S in terms of R and T. So it's always like expresses one variable in terms of other variables. Now these answer choices help us out because it's telling us that we're isolating S. So we're not doing much else past just moving these variables around. And even if they didn't give us S equals, it's always going to be the variable that says expresses blank variable. That's the one you're going to be isolating. So I'm going to take 5R equals 8S plus T. And all we're doing is working through PEMDAS backwards to isolate S here. Addition, subtraction. We want to subtract, do the inverse of what's being done to T. We're going to subtract T on both sides. We got 5R minus T equals equals 8s. And then multiplication and division is next. So 8 is getting multiplied by s, which means we are going to divide 8 by s. And these cancel and we have 5r minus t over 8, which luckily is our first nature choice, which is so exciting. So don't be scared by these. It's just some simple isolating variable problems set up with kind of complicated wording. I hope that last minute study helped you guys. If you're looking for some more content to study before your PSAT, click the link below.